In Jesus' public ministry, a lawyer came to him and said, Teacher, what is the greatest commandment? And Jesus said it was to love God and to love neighbor. And then this lawyer went on another question and said, Well, who is my neighbor? And then Jesus told this very famous parable, the parable of the Good Samaritan. And in that parable, we note that the Samaritan reached out in a very neighborly way, not on the basis of, of being of the same religion or language or, or color of skin of the person, but simply because that person was in need. In our parish here, we have a, a little video from a parishioner named Dave Steves. And in so many ways, he is an example of someone who is a good Samaritan. He reaches out in a very loving and compassionate way to indigenous peoples who are in need. That's his story. It's his response. And we can ask ourselves, what is our response? If I'm to be a neighbor to those in need, what is my response? Hello, my name is Dave Steves, and I've been a member of the St. Pat's Parish for over 35 years. As a parish, we're going through the process of determining what we can do and the contributions we can make to assist in the healing uh, within the truth and reconciliation work uh, with our uh, brothers and sisters in Indigenous communities. And I thought it'd be useful to share with you some work that I'm doing with other volunteers in a nor northern Ontario community called Pekanjikum. Been doing it for nine years. And use this potentially as an example of the impacts that we can make as individuals or as groups in the lives of those uh, who are struggling in the north. So let me share, you, share with you a little bit about what we're doing up in Pekanjikum. So once again, thank you for this opportunity to speak about Pekanjikum. What I would like to do is to provide you with a brief overview of our work there, while furthering connecting you to the community through the lens of my camera. Pekanjikum is an Ojibwe community and a former Hudson's Bay trading post uh, situated on the Barren River in northern Ontario about a 22-hour drive from here to a place that feels like an underdeveloped country. What makes this Christian community of 3,000 of particular note is that between 2001 and 2012, 70, 70 community members died by suicide with 714 attempts, designating it as having the highest suicide rate in the world. This string of suicides led to an inquiry and a report from the chief coroner of Ontario, with many outsiders labeling Pekanjikum as being in a state of perpetual mourning. In 2011, shortly after the release of the report, several of us who worked with First Nations previously were asked by the coroner to assist as volunteers in determining root cause. And that's where my journey began as part of the Pekanjikum Working Group. As background, Pekanjikum has an average of 8 to 12 people crowded into small homes, usually three to four generations in each. Currently, only 90 of the 400 homes have running water, with most water being gathered in blue bottles from only seven water pipes, and mostly by the children. Most homes do not have bathrooms. Open pit toilets are situated in front or the backyards. Burial plots for their deceased are seen in many front yards. In many cases, these plots providing sad reminders of those who took their lives. 95% of the households are on social assistance, yet food is two to four times the cost that we pay down here in Markham. 600 students are enrolled in the K-12 school, with another 200 not attending. School dropouts significantly increased after the school burned down in 2007, with classes having to move to portables. 
And finally, though a dry community, alcohol bootlegging exists, with many, particularly the young, turning to gas sniffing to escape reality. Took this picture when I was first up in the community, and I would see uh, beside many of the houses, there are vehicles parked right up beside, and I'm wondering, boy, they're, they don't know how to park their vehicles very well until I asked. And found out this is done on purpose to prevent the youth from getting access to the gas cap. Uh, what they do if the gas cap's available, they will siphon the gas out, put it in a baggie, and sniff it as a way to uh, get a high. So not a picture any of us could imagine in our own backyard of Ontario. But it does exist here and in other communities across Canada. A picture of such despair that has led many to taking their own lives to escape it. In 2012, as part of the working group, we paid our first of many visits to the community and determined that the first order of business agreed to by the chief and council was to find solutions to provide running water and sewage systems to the most neediest and their children. This is where we have been focusing our efforts for the last eight years, not in just raising awareness with the public and government, but in fundraising and developing cost-effective permanent fixes for this community, and in offering love and hope. Pekanjikum, like most Indigenous communities across Canada, are not looking for handouts, just a hand up to help bring dignity back to their lives. So this, so my message of despair and sadness is now evolving into one of good news, optimism, and hope. Firstly, good news in seeing the direct impact of the first 20 homes of water and sewage systems that we have now installed with your support, including a donation from the Archdiocese of Toronto through the 2016 Moving Forward Together campaign. When I was up there in 2019, I had an opportunity to meet several of the families who now have running water, such as the Peters family of 13, mostly young children who are now freshly showered and attending school every day, no longer being bullied due to lack of hygiene or of ill health. The mother said that with water, bathing is most critical. The mother said that she, uh, sorry, that I also noticed that many of those with systems installed have a renewed sense of pride of ownership in their homes, a feeling of being special. As an aside, one mother thought her system uh, was leaking because the water system needed refilling several times a week. But it turned out that one of her young ones kept flushing the toilet for entertainment because she had never seen such a device before. That was quickly resolved with some training. And in fact, uh, she's the little, uh, little munchkin here on the left um, in, the, in that home. And happily, the seven young adults we trained in the skills of plumbing and wiring for the water project are all now gainfully self-employed building bathrooms, and maintaining others. All very encouraging. Secondly, further good news is that the community officially opened their new school in 2017, 10 years after the previous building burned down. I had an opportunity to tour the building, and my hope is that it will provide a cornerstone for the young men and women and their futures, blending the teachings of a modern Ontario curriculum with their cultural ways. Lastly, like many First Nations, um, Pekanchikum was on unreliable diesel generation for their electric power, which was at its limits, yet each house required additional power to run our water systems. But as of 2019, they have now been connected to the power grid thereby reducing their dependence on unreliable diesel generation going forward. This is great news. So progress is being made on several fronts, but much more to do. 
Our priorities going forward, agreed to by Chief and Council, remain on two fronts. Given the success of the first 20 homes, the last 20 being completed with the assistance of Habitat for Humanity, we are now in the midst of Phase 3 and 4 installations, again focused on the neediest families. This has included the training of additional high school graduates in plumbing, electrical, and construction, both male and female. Due to COVID, our presence has not has been restricted, though many of these grads continued with the construction with our welcomed oversight. We are also now in the midst of planning beyond 2022, using a different design to incorporate more homes for less cost and reducing reliance on cisterns and water trucks. Funding for this phase is from continued private donations. We also, there is a need continuing, or there is a continuing need for developing youth programs to keep their growing younger generation engaged, busy, and employed. We have received approval from Chief and Council to start a forestry project, which included providing Pacanjicum with a portable sawmill, which is already there, and training for 10 young men and women, which has been completed, to operate the mill and convert trees into housing grade lumber, as well as proper harvesting of their forest. This initiative is also partially funded by Natural Resources Canada. We are helping them develop the requisite responsible life skills, as well as the business planning behind the program also in providing them a source of modest income. We now have a permanent site uh, for this initiative. And in fact, Wate Power uh, donated the trees they cleared to make way for the new power line to this project. Initially for firewood for the elders and eventually graded lumber for building new houses of which 200 are desperately needed, as well as for repairing existing structures. So the future, like previous years, will be busy. And with, the con with continued prayers and support, the volunteers of the Pacanchicum Working Group will continue to truly make a difference in Pacanchicum, as well as in developing a partnering model for use in other needy Indigenous communities across Canada. Miigwech and thank you. So we as individuals can make a difference. And I look forward uh, to working with uh, many members of the St. Patrick's Parish um, in determining how we can make a difference and assist in the healing through the truth and reconciliation process. And making a difference in a, a community just like Pacanjicum and, in, and improving the lives of our Indigenous brothers and sisters and as I mentioned earlier, uh, bringing dignity back to their lives. Thank you, and uh, miigwech.